Hola, buenas noches. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por venir a este nuevo evento del SEAC. Es un lujo que seamos tantos hoy para recibir a Pierre Vittorio Aureli. No me quiero demorar en presentaciones, ya que Pancho Liernur va a estar introduciendo a Pierre Vittorio y creo que tenemos una larga sesión juntos. Eh, solo quería avisarles que el próximo evento del SEAC va a ser el lunes que viene que tuvimos que cambiar una fecha como hoy por River, que vamos a estar recibiendo al artista y arquitecto Luis Úrculo. Y bueno, para pasar a inglés e incluir a Pierre Vittorio, Pierre Vittorio, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of the public programs at the school. I personally believe you've influenced more than, than one generation of, of architects and students here. Um, that you've managed to reconcile them with the study of history, with the study not only of history of architecture, but of histories of societies, that you've managed to make architects more aware of themselves, of their cultural value, their economical value, and their historical value. So we are really happy to have you here. Pancho, uh, the floor is yours to continue. Bueno, ¿qué tal? Este, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, yo lo que tengo para decirles es, en primer lugar, obviamente, agradecer a Pierre Vittorio que esté aquí con nosotros, este, agradecerles a ustedes, este, y que realmente es, eh, es un logro importante eh, que él esté aquí. Eh, y de, quisiera decir en primer lugar que yo, a mí me parece que Pierre Vittorio es una especie de rara avis este, y como rara avis es que nos pareció importante que, que él estuviera con nosotros hoy porque no voy a hacer la, la, la biografía ni nada, todo eso está, eh, primero que está, está en el flyer, todos ustedes lo conocen y por eso están aquí este, de manera que no me voy a extender en eso, lo que queremos es escuchar lo que él tiene para decirnos pero a mí me parecía importante sí eh, destacar eh, por qué Pierre Vittorio está aquí, digamos, por qué decidimos eh, invitarlo. De alguna manera, lo que decían, recién, recién decía Javier, eh, y, y nos introduce a esto. Y, y el punto es que, eh, cuando, y cuando, cuando digo que se trata de una rara a veces es porque es su trayectoria y su persona ¿no? son una confluencia de un montón de intereses eh, y sobre todo me parece a mí eh, una conjunción de una vocación muy importante de articular el campo de, eh, de la práctica de la arquitectura él tiene, como todos ustedes saben es parte de un estudio, Dogma que produce este, ideas de arquitectura que produce proyectos de arquitectura es un productor de arquitectura pero al mismo tiempo, eh, esto no va solo, esto va articulado con el, la convicción de que no hay eh, una realmente profunda aproximación a, al proyecto y a la arquitectura sin al mismo tiempo una profunda preocupación por la teoría y por la, y por la historia. En ese sentido es que digo que se trata de una, de una rara avis. Eh, y, ¿Y por qué entonces él está aquí? Porque, bueno, nosotros estamos... Eh, hemos creado hace más de 20 años una maestría que se llamaba al principio, se vino llamando Maestría en Historia y Cultura de la Arquitectura y la Ciudad, un nombre muy complejo que hace 20 años se justificaba porque había que resaltar esa, esta cuestión de este, los temas culturales y los temas de la ciudad, que la arquitectura no era un hecho aislado, pero muchos motivos nos, nos han llevado a, 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 a tratar a, de, a, actualmente de hacer un cambio en eso y de iniciar un nuevo periodo de la maestría que queremos uh, identificar como una maestría en historia y crítica de la arquitectura. 
eh, en la convicción de que estas dos cosas son absolutamente imprescindibles, en la convicción de que eh, la, a, la arquitectura lleva implícito per se la idea de la cultura y, las ideas, y digamos, la aproximación a la ciudad. Entonces nos pareció que, eh, de alguna manera, esto podría ser una suerte de conferencia inaugural de, esta, de este nuevo ciclo de la maestría, este, y, y esa conferencia inaugural tenía sentido si era eh, llevada a cabo por una figura que fuera capaz de este, eh, mostrarnos esta, esta articulación, esta síntesis. Eh, realmente no, no, no fue este, la idea estuvo antes de la figura de Pierre Vittorio como, como representante de esta idea y, eh, y trabajamos bastante en, en determinar quién debía ser una persona o un, o un colega que expresara esta, esta vocación de articulación y nos pareció que de varios que podrían haber sido este, la tarea de Pierre Vittorio era quien la representaba mejor por ese motivo es tan importante su presencia hoy, espero que ese mensaje sea, sea recibido y, y hasta aquí las cosas que venimos haciendo son más que productivas en esta dirección que decía así que de nuevo muchísimas gracias Pierre Vittorio este, y ahora es tu momento In Buenos Aires, the first time I'm uh, in Argentina, although I've been many times in South America, but it's the first time I'm here in Argentina. Uh, I apologize if I am seated, uh, but I've been walking uh, the whole day through Buenos Aires, so <laughs> I cannot really uh, be standing anymore, uh, so I hope it's fine uh, for you, but maybe um, it's also a bit of a more relaxed uh, conversation. Um, and also I have to warn you, uh, the lecture is going to be a bit longer, but uh, it took me like 13 hours to get here, uh, <laughs> so you have to suffer as well. <laughs> um, so the, the title of the lecture is uh, uh, Burning Down the House, and you will uh, understand uh, at the end of this lecture why I choose uh, uh, this title. And the lecture actually is going to be a critique of domestic space, so a critique uh, of something that is very common to us, uh, that we know uh, almost uh, before actually we, we become uh, architects. Um, and the reason why I present to you this, uh, uh, this um, lecture is because uh, in the last years, uh, most of my efforts, both as, a, as an architect, but also as a, I don't know, theorist, critic, um, has been really uh, an attempt to um, develop uh, a, um, an archaeology, if you want, uh, of, of, of domesticity, of domestic space, and especially um, an archaeology that is actually an attempt also to, to criticize uh, this uh, uh, both uh, obvious but also very hegemonic uh, uh, institution. So uh, the lecture uh, is, uh, is a summary of many things, uh, of uh, several books that I uh, wrote together with my uh, partner, uh, Dogma, Martino Tartara. Although uh, in this lecture I will not show you any, any of my designs, so it will be uh, uh, mostly, uh, actually, it will be a completely uh, theoretical lecture. Uh, but it's actually coming from the practice in a way, so I really want to stress how uh, <coughs> Even my more theoretical investigations are always rooted uh, in my uh, practice, but also uh, uh, the, the lecture is a summary of my teaching, uh, because in the last uh, years I've been teaching a lot of courses on the history uh, of domestic space. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, my uh, main concern at the moment is really this uh, topic. So in a way the lecture is going to be a sort of uh, uh, summa uh, of this uh, concern, And uh, I really hope that it will not be too boring for you, especially because I didn't expect so many people. Uh, I usually, I'm used to uh, smaller audiences, um, and I see a lot of people standing or sitting uh, 
on the floor, which makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, because actually, I, I, I might have to cut the lecture because I can't see people. Anyway, I hope you will stay and until the end, because at the end you will see why I choose this uh, title. Actually, the title is more literal than, than, what you, than you think. So, um, let me start uh, uh, by uh, really um, addressing the most uh, uh, crucial uh, aspect uh, of our uh, discussion. That is the very definition of the word uh, uh, domestic. Um, uh, of course, you know very well uh, that uh, uh, the word domestic comes from uh, the Latin word uh, domus. Uh, and domus actually, uh, in, uh, Latin, in the Latin language, uh, meant uh, not just the house as a physical uh, artifact, which was also uh, known as domus, but also its content, uh, actually the, uh, the familia. Uh, the familia in the uh, Latin uh, Roman culture was in fact uh, the congregation of uh, family. Uh, family means uh, servant. Uh, who were actually both uh, the uh, family members, but also the slaves that were part of the domus uh, uh, cohort. And the household was really the uh, property uh, of the Pater Familias, who was actually the, the owner uh, of, the, of the house. Um, actually, uh, the etymological root of this word is uh, quite interesting. Sorry for the typo. You will see a lot of typos in my slides because every time I move from Mac to PC, uh, there is something happened that I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I apologize for some typo here and there. But anyway, the, the etymological root of the word uh, domus is the uh, Greek word demi, uh, which means to build. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, domus uh, has many declensions, uh, uh, such as dominium, uh, dominus, uh, and domination. And here, actually, we find a, a very important uh, clue. First of all, uh, domus, uh, or domestic space, has something to do with building. So in a way, uh, it almost reminds us that every time we build, uh, we put something permanent on the ground, we appropriate uh, that ground. So in a way, there is some very ontological relationship between the act of building uh, and the act of domination. No? And this actually uh, goes very back uh, in time, of course. At the same time, uh, domus is also uh, a word that implies uh, an act of uh, uh, dominion. I mean, it defines actually a dominion that is in fact the very uh, content uh, uh, of the domus. So, from this uh, uh, very concise uh, uh, etymological uh, analysis, we can claim, uh, perhaps, that domestic space addresses not simply a space of inhabitation, which is usually the common definition of domestic space, uh, but a space organized around a vector of command, uh, which is actually the uh, dominus, in this case, no? the, the subject of uh, the uh, domus. But the vector of command is property. We cannot understand uh, the history of domestic space without uh, considering the concept of property. And actually, most of my lecture will be on this uh, concept. Very important one, especially when we think about the architecture of domestic space. Of course, property of the household, and by property of the household, I mean property not just of the house, but also of what the house uh, contains. <coughs> Uh, but of course, most crucially, property of land. We know that uh, one of the fundamental uh, objects of property, of course, property is a concept that can be uh, extended to everything, you know? uh, from to people, to animals, to objects, to houses. But uh, uh, since actually Roman times, the most important uh, item of property usually is land. Now, when Romans actually uh, were theorizing the idea of property, public uh, or private property, res publica or res privata, they were mainly thinking about possible litigations about land. Uh, when we, we, when we uh, think about property, especially when we think about property in terms of, uh, let's say, domestic space, we immediately have to link uh, the concept of property to land property to the property of land. It's there that where all the problems actually uh, begins. Uh, 
So, in a way, the property of land uh, is the tool through which uh, someone then become, is in charge no, of domestic space. And that someone can be the pater familias, as in the case of the Roman domus, the patriarch, the owner, the landlord, uh, the state, uh, uh, and today, of course, the real estate no, is actually the contemporary landlord. What is interesting is that uh, in this uh, uh, sequence, you see a sort of abstraction of the order. No? We start with the patriarch. Of course, patriarchs are still <laughs> existing. They're not, uh, they've not disappeared yet. But somehow we arrive to, of course, the landlord, who is actually the big owner, uh, then the state. No? The state actually, especially in the 20th century, was the big owner of, of housing, the, the big uh, uh, landlord. And of course, today, actually, the state is no longer uh, in charge of housing. Most of housing that is produced today is actually owned by real estate, who actually makes profit uh, out of it. So historically, the architecture of domestic space uh, can be understood as both representation, representation meaning the ideo ideological uh, aspect, uh, 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 and naturalization of this vector of command. So, in a way, my thesis uh, is that the invention of domestic space has to do with representing property, but also naturalizing it. Naturalizing it meaning, means making it acceptable as something that is given, that we cannot actually uh, change. No? Once we are uh, either the objects or the subjects of property, we accept it, we can change it. And of course, this happens through uh, two uh, conditions. One is the habitual. So uh, there is no more habitual space than domestic space. It's the space where we don't really pay attention to because we are very used to it. And of course, this habitual condition usually is the fundamental mechanism through which institutions uh, crystallize their power. But also through uh, uh, an even more subtle and decisive conditions that is actually a class. Of course, we know that property has a lot to do with class. In a way, uh, to own property is really what uh, usually differentiates between one class and the other, between the rulers and who is actually the rule. Uh, also, gender uh, play a very important role. We know that domestic space usually identify uh, in a very strong way gender roles. And of course, status. Uh, we know that uh, through history, domestic space, more than a space of inhabitation, has also been a, a, an instrument to represent uh, the status of the person who lives uh, in, that, uh, in that space. And what is interesting is that if you look to architectural theory, you see this condition that every uh, statement about domestic space is always assuming domestic space as the starting point of everything. Now, the famous uh, frontispiece uh, of Logier, uh, famous uh, uh, and influential uh, essay on architecture, presents the, the primitive hut, which essentially is a, is a house, as the ground zero of everything, of civilization, of architecture, uh, uh, and let's say of, of our way to inhabit the world, as if before there was nothing. No? That's uh, what I call uh, naturalization. Uh, as, uh, naturalization means that we assume the domestic space as an unquestionable uh, primeva, almost, uh, space of, uh, of life. And of course, we know that uh, uh, the subject of this uh, uh, primeva domestic space uh, is the family. No, domestic space is very much linked to the history of property, which is also the history of the family. The family is essentially a, a means of property. Of course, we are we, you know, we all love our families. Maybe not everybody, um, but of course, what binds us to our, uh, to family is not just affective relationships, are also legal and economic relationships. And these relationships are very important. They are a fundamental structure. <coughs> In, in the way in which society is actually is organized. Even today when it seems that the uh, family uh, in, as an institution is very much undermined by our uh, 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 contemporary economic conditions. But 
it has been always like that. Can we really accept that the house uh, and domestic space is the starting point of everything? Well, of course not. Uh, that's my second uh, thesis. Uh, the second thesis is that uh, it's a fundamental mistake to think uh, uh, domestic space uh, as a manifest uh, destiny of humankind. Uh, and maybe uh, a very simple exercise to uh, counter this uh, assumption is to rehearse uh, very shortly our history uh, as a human species. Um, you know that uh, Homo sapiens actually is 300,000 years uh, old, maybe 350,000, maybe 400,000 uh, years old. Uh, and the early evidence uh, of sedentary life uh, dates back only to 15, 10,000 uh, years ago. This means uh, that for a very long time in our history we have not been domestic. So actually, one can say domestic space is the very last minute invention uh, of our species. No? So it's something that we have invented at the very last uh, moment. If you compare these 300,000 years to uh, the time of a day, it's like we have invented domestic space in the last hour. No, in the 11 hour, as we used to say. So for a very long time, we have not been domestic. And that's very important. No? That's very important to understand. Of course, we have no idea what we were before we have become domestic. There are a lot of uh, hypotheses, of course, but actually we don't know much about this uh, pre-history. -pre but this pre-prehistory is actually very important, and more and more archaeologists and anthropologists are trying to actually make guesses about this time because it can tell a, a lot, can tell us a lot about why we have we got stuck uh, into uh, domestic space. So we can say that sedentary domestic. Uh, I think my microphone is doing some yeah. unpleasant noise. Maybe I can use the. Let's try. I already ordered you another one. That's. I can. I can just hold it like that. You no. Know? Yeah, that would be better. Yes. No. Still making noises. But I can use the the other one. No. No. Okay. Is it working now? Let's yeah, move it around. Yes. Okay. So we can say that sedentary domestic form of life are very recent uh, event uh, in history. So who we were before this moment? Uh, the usual name that is uh, associated with forms of life that precede uh, sedentary life is hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers means that people were mostly living out of hunting uh, and gathering. Uh, actually. Uh, Today, anthropologists and archaeologists say that uh, gathering was more important than hunting. Uh, gathering means collecting, foraging uh, food. Uh, and of course, uh, this name actually is a name that is given to people who are not uh, sedentary. I have to say that, uh, uh, and I'm not the only one, I found this term uh, very problematic uh, because, uh, as you will see in a moment, it completely falsifies uh, what these people were really uh, about. So I propose, sorry. actually, I'm sorry, yeah, maybe I use the that one. Yeah. Okay. So with this one. Yeah. I'm fine with this one. Yeah. The old way. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, it's on. So I would actually use this term, non-domestic forms of life. Okay. So. Let me put. Uh, <laughs> shall I use just the voice? Yes, without trying, I think I'm trying to get IT to come. So okay. Turn it so really, maybe I should not move now, or <laughs> I should remain still. No, you know, we're waiting for IT to come. Okay. And, and bring I, a, can you hear me without microphone? Yes. Okay. Great. So but we'll bring we'll bring a new one in a minute. Okay. <sighs> So, um, let me put forward a few uh, theses about uh, these non-domestic forms of life, you know, what actually we commonly know as hunter-gatherers. The first uh, uh, assumption that I would like to put forward is that non-sedentary people cultures have a sense of form. Um, so here you see um, an Aboriginal campsite 
uh, of a culture that used to be uh, non-sedentary and used to move around uh, very frequently. So this campsite would last only for uh, one or two days. But the way actually these people would settle was extremely organized. Um, actually, uh, the organization follow a very uh, precise kinship uh, lineages, uh, but these lineages were immediately translated into space. So the distance between the different uh, groups um, was actually very uh, carefully uh, considered, uh, and also the orientation and the grouping of different people which were not following a family uh, pattern. And you see actually the, uh, that their uh, main form through which to organize this settlement was a windbreak. So not a roof, uh, but actually uh, a very low uh, partition. So in a way, this really shows us that uh, to be non-domestic doesn't mean that we are <coughs> grouping, let's say, dropping in the, in the dark. Actually, uh, these people had a very strong sense of form. I would say an even more sophisticated uh, sense of form than we have as a domestic uh, uh, species. The second assumption is that non-sedentary cultures have a, a sense of place. Uh, non-sedentary people were not actually moving uh, handlessly. They were moving always uh, around the same region. They would, would actually be very um, attached to places, to certain kind of landmarks like water holes, lake, mountains that they use actually as a, as a landmark, as points of reference, and actually they would move uh, often seasonally in order to not uh, uh, spoil the resources of this place. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, uh, non-sedentary people were not nomadic. This is actually a completely wrong assumption. They actually had a very strong uh, uh, sense of, uh, of place. Uh, of course, I'm generalizing here. There are many different non-sedentary cultures. So. Uh, just cut me some slack about the fact that I'm a little bit generalizing here. Another very important assumption is that non-sedentary people took care of their land. Actually, often they have, uh, they uh, had what we can call agricultural practices. Uh, like, for example, they cultivate land uh, through fire. When the early colonists came to Australia, for example, they were really shocked to see all these uh, fires happening through the land, and they soon realized that they, this fire was used in order to make the land uh, very fertile and to basically allow foraging activities to be more uh, sustainable. And actually, uh, this, the sketch that you see here is a sketch by a settler, uh, an English settler, who was both amazed, uh, but also didn't want to acknowledge that uh, as a form of agriculture. Because, of course, English settlers want, wanted to claim that that land was all, not owned uh, by the uh, indigenous uh, uh, people. No? So agriculture was really understood by Europeans uh, as a means of possession. No? So to uh, look to a culture that uh, could cultivate without claiming possession was something that they could not uh, accept. And finally, another very important uh, assumption is that non-sedentary people cultures build temples, <coughs> build architecture. We have evidence today of uh, uh, cases, like for example, the very famous one of uh, Gobleki Tepe <coughs> in, uh, in Turkey, uh, which is uh, a very old uh, uh, architectural complex. Uh, uh, be, very impressive, very monumental one, but uh, archaeologists actually have claimed that the people who built uh, this temple were not sedentary yet. And of course, these temples were very strategic because in their own moving uh, around uh, the building of permanent structures was always very strategic in order to um, claim a certain uh, territory. No? But of course, this uh, permanence this claim of, of land was not uh, um, in terms of housing, it was only in terms of building communal, uh, communal spaces. So what I want to uh, say by showing you uh, those, this evidence is that non-domestic cultures build habitats, but not houses. And th this is for me a very important thing to uh, keep in mind. So that you can build an habitat, uh, 
without actually building a house. For a long section of our history, that's what we have done. We have built habitats, uh, but not necessarily houses. So the big question, therefore, is how did uh, homes became houses? No? How these habitats became permanent houses? How did sedentism uh, started? Of course, this is a very complex, uh, uh, it requires a very complex answer. But for me, there is a, a, a sentence by the anthropologist uh, Jerry D. Moore that uh, uh, really uh, give a very uh, concise but convincing uh, 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 answer to this question. When he said that sedentism and domestication develop when people have too much stuff. In other words, we have become sedentary not because we needed uh, to be uh, sedentary. We have become sedentary because at a certain point in our history, we have started uh, uh, to accumulate stuff and therefore uh, property. Victoria, yes. Let me you so much in the back. So yeah. I'm okay. going to try with the mic and we have someone from my team to, to try to see what is the problem. Okay, let's see if it works. <coughs> so, accumulation is the very reason for domestic space, not in habitation. Accumulation is the very uh, reason why we got stuck uh, into domestic space. So in a way we can think uh, the house not uh, as a space of inhabitation, but as a storage. I really believe that the very purpose of a house is not inhabiting, is storing. Which is actually mean, of course, storing of people, uh, animals, but also goods. And in fact, it's not by chance uh, that when uh, we study early examples of uh, sedentary cultures, we come across uh, a lot of examples of houses that were often built uh, either on top or very close uh, to storages. This is, uh, for example, a very interesting uh, uh, house that was excavated in Chayanu, uh, in again in Turkey. Um, and this uh, house actually had uh, this uh, uh, foundation built in stone. The houses most probably were built in uh, timber. Uh, but the plinth of these houses was built in stone and this plinth would contain several rooms which we know uh, were used as storage. And it's quite interesting that this storage was very uh, secluded, so invisible to people outside of the household. So there is, uh, the storage really also means this very strong sense of privatization uh, of stuff. So unlike actually hunter-gatherers, which usually uh, shared uh, their own uh, possessions, and also had to have very uh, little possessions in order to be uh, mobile. In the case of sedentary people, we have actually the accumulation of stuff, so the needs to build a, a proper space for this uh, accumulation, but also we have privatization, we have an enclosure uh, of space. And in fact, uh, if we look to the evolution of housing types, especially in uh, uh, regions that became urban uh, very early on, like uh, Mesopotamia, we see how the house becomes uh, uh, almost uh, an evolution in terms of enclosure and subdivision. No? So the house really becomes a, a war box, a storage that needs to collect uh, and privatize uh, uh, people, uh, animals, and goods. So in order to do so, the house has to become bigger and bigger. No, because, of course, especially with the development of agriculture, the formation of uh, extended families, uh, the needs uh, for uh, storage, uh, the houses actually have to increase their own uh, dimensions. Uh, so, in a way, enclosure and subdivisions becomes the fundamental um, architectural feature of, the, of domestic space, something that for us is very normal, uh, but at, at this point uh, is really uh, a new condition for our uh, species. So in a way, this is really the, the household. So in, in a nutshell, I give you uh, a sort of uh, uh, idea of how the household uh, came into uh, being. We have seen how the household uh, is very much connected with property, but also uh, especially the family. In a way, the family is the property. Uh, of the uh, household. And of course, because the household is such a strategic container, 
um, it, it becomes really an economic uh, uh, complex. Not by chance, uh, the word economy uh, comes from uh, oikonomia, uh, oikos nomos, which means management of the household. Actually, until the 18th century, uh, with the rise of political economy, um, when you would mention the word economy, you would mention actually the management of the house, no? which in the uh, modernity becomes the management of society at large, which is interesting. <coughs> no? You see that how the logic of property, of managing property within the house, within modernity, expand uh, across uh, the entire uh, society. Uh, and of course, uh, we can uh, really read this kind of economic uh, logic of the house when we look uh, to uh, the ancient Greek uh, oikos that gave, in fact, uh, the name to this, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, understanding of the house as a, a oikonomia, as economy, um, such as, for example, the ancient Greek uh, uh, oikos, you see how uh, strategic was the rectangular uh, uh, subdivision uh, of the house. For us, this is something very normal, but you have to understand that for many cultures, uh, rectangular subdivision was very uh, foreign uh, idea. You know, people actually usually uh, build houses as uh, circles, no? which is the most natural way to build uh, uh, shelters. Uh, rectangular subdivision becomes instrumental when, in fact, you have to subdivide the house into many rooms, into different rooms. And of course, in the Greek oikos, each room has a, a, a specific uh, function. For example, the most uh, uh, public functions, uh, like for example, the andron, uh, which was a, a male uh, space of the house, is very close to the entrance. Well, actually, women were often uh, rec um, secluded on the back uh, of the house, where in fact the kitchen was located. So in a way, the house really becomes a, a sort of map no, of gender roles. Uh, also, the house has usually only one uh, entrance uh, in order to make the house as close as possible towards public space. And of course, the very uh, goal of the house is to individuate the family as the very uh, cornerstone uh, of society. And in fact, uh, if you have read uh, Aristotle's politics, you have noticed this uh, interesting paradox uh, that the very first part of that book uh, is not about politics, it's about the family. Because for Aristotle, there is no police, there is no politics uh, if there is not this uh, first uh, unit of society, which is actually the family. This is actually a very controversial um, uh, idea because in fact, uh, According to Aristotle, the family is apolitical because its relationships cannot be questioned, are unquestionable. The relationships of the family are between father and son, master and slave, husband and wife. And for Aristotle, these relationships are natural, are given, cannot be changed. And yet, is exactly this unchangeable, uh, I would say almost despotic domain that is at the very basis of the political life uh, of the city. And these are very crucial paradox, no? which is really symbolized by the fact that the very uh, architecture of the house, uh, its rectangular subdivision, then determined the logic of the city as well. No? The uh, use of the grid in the ancient, uh, ancient Greek cities, but also in many ancient Greek, uh, um, in, the, in ancient uh, cities was often a way to organize in the most efficient way uh, property, private property, to give actually to different uh, uh, family units uh, a parcel uh, of land. No? The invention of the grid is very much tuned uh, to this uh, idea, to the parcelization of land and the management of property. So you see how the logic of private property becomes, in fact, the logic uh, of the city as, as, as well. So, in a way, we can say uh, that the household is the property of the family. Uh, the household requires uh, economy, requires a, a very careful organization that we can call oikonomia or house management. And it's quite interesting, it's exactly these uh, uh, needs of careful organization of the household that gave origin to one of the strongest traditions in modern uh, architecture. By modern architecture means the architecture that starts in the 15th century. That is actually what I would call the tradition of typological design. 
Typological design is a form of design that is not, uh, um, not following the uh, invention, formal invention, which is usually our you know, understanding of architectural design, but follows existing types. Types that you have to basically reinforce and, and reproduce. And typological design is, a, I would say, the most important tradition of what I would call modern architecture. Uh, and of course, its goal is to reinforce uh, the conditions that uh, develop within uh, domestic uh, uh, space, although then later on, topological design ext is extended to also other, other programs. So here I want, just want to give you a few uh, examples of what, of what I mean by typological design. These are a series of diagrams, drawings, by uh, Francesco Di Giorgio, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, architect of the second half of the uh, 15th century are uh, in fact uh, um, plans of palazzis, uh, houses for uh, very wealthy uh, people. And it's interesting that uh, uh, these uh, sketches are one of the very first uh, uh, example of, uh, of an architect uh, who is engaging in what uh, Di Giorgio calls tribuzioni di stanze, distributions of rooms. No? So he's really trying to find uh, the best way uh, to organize a uh, sequence of rooms around, uh, of course, uh, courtyards. Um, and it's quite interesting that he also tried to give names uh, to these rooms, like sala, uh, atrio. So in a way, domestic space has a lot to do with nomenclatures, no? finding the right uh, name to a space in order to dictate uh, its use. But for me, the most telling uh, aspect of these drawings is that, uh, um, like almost like a contemporary architect, Di Giorgio is almost designing diagrams rather than the actual architecture uh, of these buildings. Uh, because, of course, uh, when it comes to domestic space, uh, organization of space becomes more important than uh, the representation. So Renaissance architects at, the, uh, at this moment in time were very much focusing on the facade. No? Uh, until the 18th century, the main um, concern of architects is the design of the, of the facade. And yet here you see an architect whose uh, main concern is not so much the uh, building, how it looks like, but more its uh, typological uh, organization. Because of course, the economy of domestic space requires this very uh, careful consideration of organization. Here, actually, another example of typological design. Uh, Sebastiano Serlio uh, is uh, uh, some example of houses uh, drawn in his uh, book uh, uh, Sixth, which, uh, as you might know, is a book uh, that Serlio devotes to uh, houses for all kinds of men, as th that's the title. And in this book, uh, he presents uh, uh, housing uh, uh, schemes uh, that cover all classes uh, of uh, society except to uh, beggars and uh, priests. Uh, apparently, uh, Serlio was a, a, a Protestant uh, uh, sympathizer, so he excluded actually monks and priests for, uh, from his uh, catalog. But actually, beside these two uh, classes, he included all classes from the, very poor, the house of the poor farmer uh, to actually houses for very uh, wealthy people and even for the uh, king. So, first of all, for me, this uh, um, diversification in terms of classes is very important because it shows that uh, at this point, uh, architects uh, like Serlio has accepted uh, that society is made of, dif of classes. Uh, that is actually a society that is not of equal people, but people that have different, belongs to different classes, from the very poor to the very rich. And of course, at the same time, you also understand that uh, when it comes to uh, designing uh, uh, domestic space, the plan uh, is more important than the elevation. And that's why in all these uh, uh, projects, you always combine elevation and plan, so that you immediately realize that the elevation, in fact, is the extrusion uh, of the plan. And of course, the, also in, like, uh, in the case of Di Giorgio, Sally really tried to give names uh, to these different uh, uh, spaces. Another interesting uh, uh, example of typological design are architects who, starting from the 18th century, try to develop 
typologies uh, of, uh, for the working class. So this is actually one of the very first book uh, published by John Wood the Younger, an English architect um, uh, from the uh, late 18th century, who actually, um, in a way, published uh, uh, a book where he uh, provided models for houses for uh, lower class uh, people. Uh, and what is it really interesting is that uh, he really insists uh, on this uh, austerity uh, of architecture because, of course, working class people have to be uh, immediately individuated as a very specific uh, uh, subject. But also, uh, he uh, very much focused on the uh, idea that uh, working space should not be uh, part of the house anymore. So this is actually one of the very first uh, books that really take a very strong position about excluding actually workspace uh, from the uh, from the house, which since then becomes the norm uh, for all uh, manual and books about domestic space, where the main idea is that uh, everything that is domestic is private, uh, is not remunerated, and therefore any working activity should be uh, excluded, in fact, from the from the house. This is actually a very famous example: the dwelling of the laboring classes by Henry Roberts one of the most influential uh, book about working class uh, families. In fact, uh, uh, this book will be consulted by many architects who, uh, uh, until the uh, uh, beginning of 20th century, will engage with the project of uh, social housing, which in the intention of these reformers is a way to educate, not just to provide uh, dwelling for uh, laboring classes, but also to educate them to the virtues of bourgeois life, meaning property and, of course, uh, family, uh, family life. So, in a way, uh, we can say that uh, uh, the uh, formation of domestic space uh, um, as a space of the family becomes, in fact, uh, the uh, precondition of another uh, important uh, uh, step uh, in the history of domestic space, that is actually the commodification of the house. Now, if the house becomes a uh, property, that means that the house is an asset. Uh, and of course, it's not just meant to uh, house the family and control the family. The house also becomes actually something that is uh, comparable to a financial uh, investment. And so another uh, history parallel to the one of the family is in fact uh, uh, the transformation of the house from use value, from something useful, something that we use uh, in order to, uh, to live in, to something that we use as an investment, as an exchange value. So let me show you in a nutshell this uh, evolution of how the house becomes a, a move from being uh, determined by use value to exchange values. The first uh, uh, episode in this transformation is the invention of the townhouse. The townhouse is a medieval house that starts to appear uh, in Europe uh, between the uh, 12th and the 13th century uh, as a way to control uh, the building of cities. So you have to imagine that, uh, especially in the 13th century, there is a huge wave of immigration uh, in cities like Siena, Florence, Bruges, Pisa. Uh, so there is an economic uh, and urban uh, uh, explosion. And in order to control uh, people that are building their house in those cities, uh, city authority rulers uh, uh, draw actually uh, very precise uh, uh, plots uh, of, of land. Uh, and in fact, uh, in many of these uh, medieval cities, uh, you could only be a citizen uh, of that city, like Pisa, for example, if you would own property uh, in the city. So in a way, the house was also not just a, a piece of property, but also the guarantee of political participation uh, in the city. So in a way, the townhouse really ex uh, st uh, start to actually um, be formalized by the, the, the parcel uh, of land. And of course, because uh, uh, in a way, the, 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 the townhouse represents the property, not just the the house, but also the property of the owner, it, 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 it really tried to, uh, it becomes actually denser and denser, also because the owner usually used the townhouse as an asset, not as a financial asset. It maybe inhabit one floor and rents uh, the next one to someone else. 
And of course, this logic of the house as a financial asset is uh, industrialized with the invention of the terrace house. Now, the terrace house, one of the most influential uh, typologies of modern uh, housing, uh, was really invented as a way to uh, put uh, into a system uh, by very wealthy uh, landlord uh, the building of housing for uh, to, to be lease, not to be lease uh, to uh, owners who would own the house for a limited amount of time, usually for 70 or um, 60 or even 100 years, and after they had to actually renew uh, the lease. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the lease would constantly be uh, increased in order to uh, um, increase actually the, the revenue for the, uh, for the landlord. No? So in a way, the terrace house, what is interesting about the terrace house is that it's a, a house that is built uh, no longer for people to inhabit. Of course, the, the terrace house was inhabited by people, but its main goal is to raise money, is to actually um, extract the surplus value from the very uh, act of uh, dwelling. And then to conclude this uh, very short survey, I think we can end uh, with the, uh, the contemporary condition, where in fact the, the, the fact that the housing is becoming a financial asset is actually paramount in many cities, to the point that uh, uh, landlords such as hedge funds uh, or even uh, investors or banks uh, buy houses that remain most of the time uh, empty. They are just like uh, uh, an asset that, that valorize basically your uh, portfolio. And it, because this investment, uh, this financial investment is affecting especially cities with uh, a lot of uh, um, land value, uh, you have actually the development of these crazy uh, forms of uh, houses, uh, such as the pencil towers, which are literally extrusion of the uh, financial uh, extraction uh, that uh, these investors actually operate within these uh, cities. So to summarize what I've said, we can say that domestication of society uh, in a way can be articulated uh, through the following uh, uh, terms. Uh, separation of living and working. So we see actually that especially with the uh, uh, rise of modern housing, uh, there is a clear separation between um, domestic labor, uh, which, is, which becomes actually the duty of the family, and remunerated work, which happened outside uh, the house. Uh, privatization of domestic labor as a natural duty of families, and especially women. So in a way, uh, the reason why um, uh, paid work is excluded from the house is because uh, in order to render any working activity inside the house natural and therefore unpaid, uh, no? again, the naturalization that comes with domestic space. And of course, spread of private property in the form of home property and land property. And finally, commodification of housing from use uh, to exchange value. So these are really the fundamental uh, characteristics uh, of the history of domestic space until, until now. But what is interesting is that uh, there are also been attempts to counter this condition. Uh, I have to say many of these attempts uh, have failed, of course because the power of property is uh, too strong, uh, is very strong. Uh, and, uh, but it, there is a history of attempts to counter uh, this condition. But before, I have to take it. So <clears throat> I would call actually this history a history of non-domestic uh, spaces. And of course, I don't have much time to really elaborate on each of these examples, so just bear with me, uh, I will be very, very concise. The first uh, uh, example of a project of countering uh, domestic space maybe is the most uh, controversial, uh, and of course the one that uh, there, will, there might be a lot of discussions whether it's really a counter uh, project of domestic space. But I would say the first, for me, interesting example is the history of monasticism. In a way, you can say that monasticism, as it develops uh, even before Christianity, uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, with the, actually the rise of uh, uh, Buddhism uh, can be seen, can be understood uh, as really one of the fundamental challenges uh, of uh, domestic space because, of course, uh, the members of monastic communities were often uh, exiting not just uh, society but often uh, households, families. And the way to organize together themselves was often uh, something that was no longer dictated uh, by the uh, rules of the family, although that happened in certain cases, but uh, in a new uh, institution where there is a very strong uh, uh, relationship between individual and collective. You shouldn't forget that the word monk comes from monos, which means alone. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, monks uh, very seldom were really hermits. Uh, most of the time, they always formed communities. But in these communities, there is a very strong tension between the individual uh, and the collective. A tension that, of course, in traditional domestic space is completely uh, erased, no? because the family took, uh, took over. So this tension is very, for example, present uh, in one of the most interesting uh, um, uh, medieval uh, orders, uh, the Carthusians, who were actually uh, were trying to go back to a Eremitic life, the original model uh, of monasticism, but somehow they organized this uh, uh, Eremitic life in communities. So you see this tension between individual and collective uh, uh, very much registered uh, in the uh, architecture. Uh, of these uh, monastic uh, houses, where you have the uh, community, which is represented by the cloister, uh, and the individual uh, houses that were inhabited by the uh, different uh, uh, monks, the hermits. Uh, of course, needless to say that this uh, not actually this uh, um, uh, Cartusian monastery, uh, the one in Florence was of course very influential to, uh, to Le Corbusier. And in fact, there is a whole history of how uh, monastic uh, architecture was in fact uh, a source of inspiration for many uh, counter-domestic projects also within the uh, uh, 19th and 20th uh, century. Another example of a counter-domestic space uh, is the rise of the residential hotel. Residential hotels uh, are uh, hotels where people uh, didn't stay for a short stay as we use hotels uh, today. So the way we use hotels today, uh, actually we don't use hotels if we go to Airbnb, so uh, even the hotel is gone as a kind of, uh, but residential hotels were hotels for very long stays, and actually in some cases, uh, people were also living. Uh, actually, my grandfather for something like 20 years of his life, he married very late, um, so he was living in a hotel. When he was telling me that when I was a kid, I was like, wow, well, you're living in a hotel? How strange. Well, yes, actually, there are cities uh, um, like San Francisco and New York, uh, for example, where uh, I would say almost two-thirds of the population uh, between the, uh, actually, in the 19th, late 19th century were living in residential hotels. There were residential hotels were for all kinds of classes. There were the palace hotels for very rich people, but there were also mid-price hotels for middle-class people and even like hotels for uh, people that had uh, working class people. Uh, and these residential hotels were usually made of uh, uh, single person rooms. Um, and, uh, and then they would have a, a, a series of services. Uh, I mean, not all hotels would have a series of services actually in the, on the ground floor. And these hotels actually were open to uh, anyone in terms of gender. So you would have uh, male people, but also women. Um, and actually, although they, 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 there was nothing utopian or socially progressive, I mean, they were really uh, just meant to speculate on people immigrating to large uh, cities. Uh, yet, uh, the fact that these people were living together uh, in a completely uh, disenfranchised way from their family, from their own also communities, uh, uh, made uh, these uh, uh, places uh, uh, incredible in terms of uh, solidarity, in terms of uh, developing relationships that were not, uh, let's say, uh, family relationships. And, and in fact, they became also the inspiration of many utopian uh, communal uh, forms of life uh, 
uh, like for example the home clubs that were developed uh, uh, in the late uh, 19th century. In fact, uh, uh, there is one very uh, interesting example um, where um, uh, material feminists, uh, feminists that were really uh, interested in the reform of domestic space, uh, took the inspiration of the residential hotel in order to imagine a completely new uh, city where uh, housekeeping and cooking uh, were centralized and professionalized. So uh, everyone would live, uh, in fact, in the same kind of apartment. Uh, and mm, uh, you would have actually the coexistence of both families and, and non-family uh, households. And you see actually what meant in terms of uh, typological design. I mean, new, completely new different uh, uh, kind of houses where there are no, uh, the rooms are not bespoke to uh, class or gender roles. Uh, but there is a, a complete reinvention of what is to live uh, uh, together. Another very interesting uh, uh, project of uh, counter domestic project uh, is the one that was launched by a very interesting uh, uh, figure of the modern movement, completely somehow to a certain extent uh, forgotten, uh, Karel Taige, uh, a Czech uh, poet, critic, uh, graphic designer, but uh, also uh, a critic of uh, uh, architecture. In 1932, he published uh, a book called The Minimum Dwelling, which, by the way, is translated, uh, I don't know if it's translated into Spanish, but is it translated into uh, English. Very, very interesting book, one of the best uh, book uh, of that uh, uh, period. Uh, the book was intended as a polemic against the existence minimum, which was the main uh, uh, Siam uh, idea of uh, domestic space, the idea of uh, developing a, a much reduced version of the family apartment in order to, uh, uh, let's say, survive the uh, crisis, the housing crisis that was affecting Europe uh, at that time. Uh, and Karel Tiger really understood the existence minimum as a sort of miniature uh, version of the family bourgeois uh, apartment. So against that idea, he proposed uh, what he called the minimum dwelling, uh, which was to, uh, set, uh, to have uh, for every member uh, of uh, society an individual cell, whether you were an infant or an adult, uh, a husband or wife or men or women or whoever. Uh, so every member would get actually uh, a cell or a room and then everything else would be socialized. Uh, kitchen, uh, cooking, bathing, uh, as you can see actually in this uh, diagram. And of course, uh, he was also very much inspired by uh, experiments uh, that were pushed forward at that time in Soviet Union, especially with the uh, development of the uh, Don Comuna, which was really an attempt to uh, uh, socialize uh, domestic labor and emancipate uh, women from domestic, uh, domestic courts. Actually, this uh, idea survived through the whole 20th century, uh, and uh, one very interesting uh, uh, episode is the co-housing movement that took uh, a place in Sweden uh, in the um, uh, 70s. Sweden actually had a massive uh, um, development in terms of welfare state and building of housing. But often all this housing uh, built by the state were for families. Uh, so. Um, there were several architectural practices. The one that I think was really uh, interesting was uh, known as uh, big, but has nothing to do with uh, uh, the Athenians, of course. Uh, in fact, it should be pronounced as B-I-G. Uh, it was a group of women. Uh, not all of them were architects. They were also journalists and sociologists. And actually, they uh, produced several schemes of building, but also retrofitting uh, existing buildings in order to accommodate uh, co-housing uh, uh, models. For example, in these examples, they uh, proposed uh, uh, to um, shrink, uh, uh, to actually get rid of uh, apartments on one floor uh, of the building, uh, and to actually uh, uh, use that floor to, uh, to redistribute the inhabitants, and then use that floor for communal uh, facilities. Uh, such as kitchens, uh, uh, crash, kindergarten. So in a way to make uh, uh, the uh, household labor uh, visible, but also shared among the different uh, families. Uh, another similar experiment uh, is this project by Dolores Hayden, one of the most important uh, 
feminist uh, historians um, who I had the privilege to have as colleague uh, uh, at Yale when I was uh, uh, teaching there. In 1985, she proposed this uh, scheme called Holmes, which was an attempt to um, uh, convince uh, a, a neighborhood of suburban houses to uh, give up their own uh, private garden and to share it uh, in order to host a series of facilities that would allow them actually to, um, in fact, uh, socialize, in fact, domestic uh, uh, labor. But of course, uh, to, uh, these uh, attempts would be um, not complete uh, uh, without mentioning uh, uh, other uh, initiatives that are not so much on uh, uh, reorganization of domestic space, uh, nor about the architecture, but really about the challenge of the idea of property. Uh, one uh, very important uh, uh, example is are the, the, the rise of community land trust, which are uh, associations that uh, uh, buy or lease uh, land collectively uh, and then prevent uh, the people who uh, use that land to resell it at uh, market price. In a way, community land trusts are a form of withdrawing uh, housing and land from the market, uh, basically. Uh, and of course, another very interesting example that I also, uh, I mean, our, our office work with, um, are the Mitzhauser Syndicate, uh, the syndicate of tenants, who again uh, uh, help uh, people to uh, build, uh, buy land uh, and build uh, houses collectively, but then the syndicate remained the actual uh, owner. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's an owner that uh, share only the 51% uh, of the whole uh, property, so that uh, basically this owner prevents uh, the members of the syndicate to uh, eventually, if they leave the, uh, the building, to resell, uh, to uh, resell actually their own property at market uh, price. So again, these are two uh, interesting uh, uh, initiatives that for me signal this uh, possibility of withdrawing, uh, in fact, uh, housing uh, and domestic space from the, uh, from the market. What is actually uh, not yet uh, uh, visible is what kind of new typologies these different uh, approaches to domestic space in terms of property can produce. I mean, in a way, it's too soon to see uh, what that uh, would be, uh, but I think there are very promising frameworks in which we can think how to challenge domestic space. So to summarize this uh, uh, project of uh, undomestication of society, uh, I would like to put forward a few uh, principles. The first one, of course, is the socialization of domestic labor and, and care. For me, this is a, a fundamental uh, way to challenge the, uh, the very uh, uh, idea, uh, ontological idea of domestic space. Uh, the commodification of land and housing, uh, without the commodifying land and housing, would never actually develop a just uh, housing. I think this, for me, goes uh, without uh, question. And of course, uh, re-theorizing the domestic, uh, uh, the idea of domestic uh, from the idea of property, which has been the fundamental uh, idea of domestic space until now, to care, uh, to care, which is something more relational, not abstract, not for uh, actually, uh, that doesn't seize uh, the house as an asset, uh, but really as, a, as an abode uh, in which we can take care of each other also beyond uh, the family. So let me go back uh, to conclude uh, um, to the title of the, of the lecture, Burning Down the House. Uh, besides actually being the title of a, a song I like a lot, I'm a big fan of the Talking Heads, uh, and besides actually being the idea, of course, behind the lecture, is also something very uh, specific uh, that has to do with this uh, uh, interesting uh, culture that existed uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, uh, of course, um, um, between the 6th and the 3rd uh, millennium uh, BC. It's a very interesting uh, culture because this culture produces uh, very large uh, uh, settlements that are comparable almost to uh, cities. Uh, but the settlements actually have uh, 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 a series of features that are really striking. 
uh, first of all, there were no city walls. Uh, that means that uh, the Cucutani, Tripilia were most probably a very peaceful culture uh, that didn't actually have to uh, force, uh, impose actually their own power on other, uh, other societies or also among uh, uh, each other. The second is that, and this is really interesting, uh, the, the houses are um, all the same. And they are neither too small nor too big. Uh, and all the houses are actually uh, uh, built around this uh, series of circles. And there is this uh, big, uh, uh, empty, um, empty space in the middle. And of course, uh, archaeologists have wondered what is that big space. Apparently, there was no kind of, there was no like a big uh, monumental building in the middle. So there were just houses and all the same. But actually, the most uh, striking uh, uh, aspect of these uh, uh, towns, uh, actually, uh, archaeologists call the Cucuteni uh, Tripilia settlements mega sites. They don't want to call them cities for some reason. Um, so they call them mega sites. Um, the most striking thing that the archaeologists have discovered is that these uh, cities were uh, mm, presented the evidence of fires that have destroyed them. Not much, uh, actually one time, but several times, periodically. So at first they thought, well, maybe it's a, an accident that would happen very often because maybe they were, I don't know, playing with fire or something like that. But actually they realized that there was really a pattern. So in every, uh, every city they found out that every 40, 50 years, they would literally destroy the entire city. I mean, with fire. Um, we don't know why. We don't know why. I mean, there is no, they didn't left any written uh, evidence of why they had this ritual. But I think it's possible to speculate that, that this kind of ritual destruction uh, of the house, of their house, was also a way to undermine uh, their sense of possession. No? Uh, as, as you remember, I started by saying that in building, uh, no, there is uh, uh, an ontological um, idea of uh, taking place, but also possessing the, the place. No? So one can argue, but take it as a, my own interpretation, that by cyclically destroying those houses, these people wanted to uh, undermine uh, their uh, sense of property. And for me, the fact that the Cucuteni seems to have been a very peaceful uh, egalitarian society uh, tells a lot of what kind of society we can be uh, if we are not so much uh, in prison uh, by uh, not just domestic space, but the idea of poverty that is the very uh, condition sine qua non of domestic space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, for your presentation. We have some time for questions. I'd like to do the, the first, taking yes. this cue. So aside from burning uh, things, what ways do you see in, uh, in the contemporary world that we can find ways to undermine this sense of possession? Whether it is uh, property as uh, real estate, but also in the fetishism of objects and so on. Yeah, I, I, as I said in my lecture, for me, uh, I mean, having spent a lot of time to, to study the, the history of domestic space, I really came to this conclusion that, in a way, the, you know, if, the, if uh, the house is the hardware, the software is property, in a way. And, uh, and that's why I'm very interested in, in cultures uh, around the world that have developed houses without actually the software of, of property. No? Um, and, uh, and, and, and so for me, besides, you know, the, 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 everything else follows this, this principle. I think the, the idea of the house as a, as a 
property and the house, not meant just the house, but everything that comes with the house is the real thing that we have to start to question. I, I think for me, the origin of many of evils that and problems we have today are have really this point of origin. And of course, the responsibility of architecture is not that uh, it's not that architecture has created property, but architecture has built one of the most uh, formidable ideological embodiment uh, of this idea. And to me, it's amazing how uh, architectural historians, uh, architectural theorists, uh, have constantly um, forgot about this uh, aspect, uh, as if uh, architecture happened without this, this um, the question of property. Do you see um, ways in contemporary architecture to address this this topic of property? Because it, it would seem as something that is uh, imposed upon us uh, yeah. with, with no question for challenge. No, I think uh, that uh, it, it, because, uh, as I said, uh, for a very long time, this concept, this idea has been neglected. Uh, it's very difficult uh, um, for us as architects to uh, really understand how to deal with it. But actually, there are a lot of, uh, mm, as I mentioned, there are a lot of communities and groups of people that are really uh, interested you know, to challenge, you know, to f find forms of living uh, uh, beyond uh, private property. And uh, you know, the question whether architects will um, work within this, uh, project, uh, it's an open question. I mean, there is not much work because, of course, uh, most, you know, as architects, we depend on clients who have capital in order to, to build architecture. Mm -hmm. And often these uh, groups of people have very limited capital uh, to, to do something. And on, beside that, uh, I should say, I should also mention that often, not always, it's not always the case, uh, but in many cases, uh, the state uh, is also often very hostile to these initiatives because we know that the state has always been uh, a defender of the right to property. In fact, uh, liberal democracy, if you think about liberal democracy, is founded on the right to property. So our own freedom is not measured by our well-being, uh, our you know, being together is measured by whether or not we can claim, we have access to property. Thank you for your answer. Yeah? Hi. Um, Victoria, I, I have a question for you regarding the idea of property and the idea of territoriality. Because I think those are two related notions and somehow property is really something that seems to be uh, clearly written within the context of ideology, but territoriality not necessarily because it's a kind of animalistic uh, property, I would say, in the, the other sense of the word property, in, in the sense of characteristic. And so my question is, uh, or my point would be, um, are we also uh, kind of deleting uh, Raising the, the animalistic dimension of uh, of property. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not. Maybe property isn't the word, but territoriality or the fact that we want to establish a certain uh, kind of uh, dominion of over, yes. over yes. space. No, no, that's a very uh, it's a very important question because, uh, of course, as I also explained in the first part of my lecture when people didn't claim property yet, uh, they have a strong sense of place. Actually, uh, even non sedentary cultures usually built like a, a stonework or a monument or a sanctuary precisely for that reason, because they want to make their own sense of relationship uh, and to a certain extent even possession visible. But this uh, possession is not uh, translated into, into um, boundaries. Uh, what happened with sedentism is that uh, once people settled, uh, they start to actually uh, 
in, inscribe uh, into land uh, their own property. <coughs> no? For example, the invention of the grid it has a lot to do with that. The grid uh, is not uh, born out of a rational idea of subdividing land in parts. It's born out of the necessity for sedentary people to uh, claim their own property and to inscribe uh, that uh, through rectangular subdivision, because rectangular subdivision is the most efficient way to subdivide land. Uh, so for me, that's the crucial, um, the crucial moment, you know, when the abstraction of property, because property is an abstraction, becomes real into this sort of uh, um, subdivision of land. Um, but before that, of course, as you said, uh, we are territorial. I mean, uh, we, 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 were, we would claim a, a place, no? We would claim, but not in, in, in those terms uh, of property. And we shouldn't forget that property is an exclusionary title. So possession, you can possess something, uh, but uh, you can also, when you're not using that thing, you can allow others to use it. This is actually how sedentary people use their land. No? They somehow use a water hole or a river, but when they're not there, someone else is using it, and it's fine. No? So that's the idea of possession is this kind of, uh, is re often based on reciprocity. Property, on the contrary, is an exclusionary title. Once you own something, uh, you, can, you are not just entitled to use it, uh, but you're also entitled to exclude others from using it. And, you know, in, and that's actually what makes possible the idea that uh, there is so much housing being built today, and most of it is empty. No? Because through poverty, no one can use uh, that uh, housing uh, because private property entitles people to own things even if they're not using them. So when we talk about property, we have a complete divorce uh, between uh, the legal uh, appropriation and, and the use. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your lecture. It's quite a relief. Um, I like this idea of this detachment from um, homelessness and houselessness. It implies, in a way, a certain subject, which is the homeless, uh, in a way, someone that has uh, no property, no uh, it's also the system, and so on and so forth. But uh, there's the houseless, which is someone who not necessarily uh, in that situation. Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, if in this detachment from house, which is property and home habitat, uh, do you see any way in which urban public space uh, could be the habitat of the house the subject? Uh, the inhabited, uh, distributed form of use across infrastructure and river environment. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. But first of all, um, we have to say that the contemporary homeless uh, is not someone who has chosen uh, this way of life, uh, is someone who is denied, uh, who is excluded by the idea of property. We should always understand that property is about exclusion. And because property is also linked to the idea of class, so there are a lot of people who are excluded from access to property in direct or indirect uh, ways. Um, and of course, we know that a lot of these people who are excluded uh, often use uh, uh, public space as, as a way to survive. I mean, they use actually the what remains of public space, of infrastructures of the city, 
as a way to uh, survive in their own condition of homeless uh, and still actually live uh, in the city. But actually today we know that the, 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 the public sector often is very hostile to this kind of use uh, of public space. Um, I'm sure you are familiar with this obscene, uh, uh, obscene um, design of benches that are uh, produced in order to uh, av avoid people to, to lay down. You know? um, I don't know if it's happening also here in uh, Buenos Aires, but actually if you go to London, all benches now have uh, like little metal plates every 40 centimeters so that uh, people cannot use them to, to lay down, to sleep on them, basically. Uh, and this shows really how uh, this idea of exclusion that is uh, very much uh, imprinted in the idea of property, and not, by the way, not just private property, also public property. Property is not only private property, it's also the property, the public property. How property is always this exclusionary uh, device through which uh, uh, who is the owner can always decide who to include and who to exclude. And I see this uh, actually happening, especially now, I mean, this uh, sort of hostility uh, to people who are homeless, not because their choice, but because they are excluded from private property. Now they are also excluded by public property, which is uh, really one of the most radical development of property that we have today. Yeah. <laughs> in the first years of the Soviet Union after the revolution, there was the, a very bright debate about the, the, the form of living as the new man that's the soft man. That must be different, very different from the bourgeois mm -hmm. form of life. That debate they have a conclusion, a very conclusion, but when you think that the building is going to be a corner, but it's not a thing. Yes. How do you see that uh, this thing treats in society without uh, private property? Yeah, actually, uh, I have to say that uh, I spent uh, uh, recently a lot of time studying the, the work of Ginsburg. Uh, and especially of the OZA group, because in my opinion, they uh, produced uh, uh, the most radical reinvention, typological reinvention of, of housing in the 20th century. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, their proposals, although they were seldom built, actually only the Narcom film building was realized of all this uh, research work, um, Nevertheless, their work had a huge uh, um, influence also in the uh, post-war period. Um, I mean, if you think of the United uh, by Le Corbusier, is uh, an interpretation of these uh, projects. But in fact, what was uh, not uh, um, developed further was really their complete destruction of the idea of, uh, of domesticity. I mean, Ginsburg uh, and Okitovic arrived to this um, concept uh, in their Zeleni uh, Gorod, uh, in their green city, of literally uh, having uh, houses for uh, uh, individual inhabitants. And these houses actually would be uh, built as a mobile home, so people could decide whether to build uh, communities or be uh, alone. And of course, the idea was to completely undermine any idea of property and any, uh, let's say, idea of uh, settling uh, and claiming property of land. And of course, uh, one can say that that idea could only be possible in a fully communist society that have completely abandoned the, the property of land. So I don't think today we can really achieve uh, such a radical project. Actually, that project was not even achieved within uh, a socialist country because after the introduction of the first five years plan, uh, these uh, experiments were completely abandoned and uh, and it was built, uh, what was built was very different. But I, I don't think today we can afford that radicality. 
but at the same time, I see in those uh, uh, smaller developments that I mentioned, like community land trust and uh, uh, syndicate of tenants, a kind of brief uh, for uh, a new way to rethink housing uh, that can question fundamental aspects of domestic space, such as the idea of property. Maybe not at the scale of those projects, maybe a, a, on a smaller scale, but at the same time, I think there is a chance for this archipelago of, of initiatives to scale up uh, and maybe in the future to have an impact on society at large. Could you, could you share with us uh, microphone? <laughs> could you share with us what, uh, something you were talking about the other day about your interest and in your current interest in the question of currency? In the question of currency. Garden. Garden, cities. garden cities, yes, yes. Well, uh, my interest in the garden cities because uh, uh, I don't know if it's something that is uh, well known, but uh, although uh, the garden city, as it was uh, invented in the uh, beginning of 20th century, it became uh, the infamous <laughs> model for the proliferation of garden suburbs. Uh, the very idea of the Garden City, as it was theorized by Benizer Howard, was really based on collective uh, ownership of land. And, uh, and the idea where land was not owned by, uh, and houses were not owned by inhabitants, uh, but it was owned by the trust uh, that would be actually self-ruled by the association of the inhabitants. And I think uh, this was a very radical uh, idea, though uh, Howard was certainly not a revolutionary uh, person, but I think there was some anarchist kind of influence in his uh, approach uh, that, of course, was completely lost when the Garden City was implemented. And uh, I see the Garden City as part of this kind of counter-domestic uh, movement. I mean, I didn't include it in my compilation because otherwise we would stay here until tomorrow. Uh, but uh, the Garden City, although paradoxically became so influential for its opposite, which is the suburbs, the, the triumph of uh, you know uh, of the suburban house and the embodiment of property, the original idea was really the common of land. I mean, in a way, Howard really made clear that common on land was the fundamental um, ratio of how the Garden City was going to be organized. And also another thing that is really important, the Garden City was not meant to be a satellite city. This is a, one of the fundamental misunderstandings of Howard's idea, partly also because his diagrams, although uh, Howard said, don't take these diagrams literally, but every time I still when I ask them to design a garden city, they start to make circles and, and circles. Uh, but in fact, the garden city would have any shape, in fact. It was not meant to be a circle. But actually, for uh, also Howard, the, the garden city was not a satellite city, which was then how the, it was implemented, but a self-sufficient uh, community uh, where live uh, and work would happen within the same settlement. But then, each settlement would be in relationship with other settlements. So in a way, the idea was that this model would proliferate, uh, again, almost as, a, as an archipelago of self-sufficient settlements that then would actually uh, eventually share some activity across uh, uh, you know, larger groups of, of settlements. So actually, in fact, I would argue that, the, to go back to the previous question, that Ginsburg idea of the linear city, in a way, it's a further um, <coughs> evolution of who were the uh, uh, who were Garden City. The problem is, of course, the Garden City took a com an opposite direction, and uh, that's why I'm interested to go back to the <laughs> to the original idea. Thank you. I have a, a question, Pierre Vittorio. Yes. 
continuing on, on this topic that um, has to do with the idea of nature. Because all, all the different models that were seen in uh, the first presentation, um, nature, yes or no? All the models were very um, land. Uh, it was it's always the, the white thing, you know? Like uh, you do a drawing and you don't draw the land, you don't draw what, what is in there. And with all the radicality of this of this topic, uh, of how to live together again, how to live modified housing, where do you think uh, nature comes into, uh, into place? And also non-human non habitats. Uh, well, actually, it's interesting that uh, um, what you said uh, is true, that uh, when you look to uh, a house, usually, uh, especially the house as an architecture, uh, usually you always look to a building that is completely um, detached from everything else. That's usually the way we look to even either photographs or drawings or whatever images of houses, they always look like you see it in the slide, and of course we know that that, that is a fiction, because houses are very complex ecological systems that are always related to a much larger complex. But that's the power of property. Property is an abstraction. So once actually property comes in, in the story of human domestication, it creates this kind of exclusionary uh, Power, you know, where you can finally single out your house from everything else. You know? uh, and, and that's actually, again, it goes back to property. Property, it's, it's a way through which we abstract the world. Uh, we abstract the world through lines, which is the, the subdivision of the, of the plot, but also we abstract the world in terms of uh, uh, mentality, because when you live in your house, you completely forget about everything else. Now, when we live in our own domestic realms, actually we even see uh, as, 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 as very um, threatening uh, if there is something happening outside. You know? So the house really has this kind of uh, logic that has to protect us from everything outside. So that's why, to me, this critique of domestic space is very important. Uh, uh, because uh, by critiquing domestic space, we critique uh, this fundamental exclusionary logic uh, that then projects itself to every aspect of life, from land uh, to environment to you know, everything else. Are you one, for, for one more one question? One last question, yeah, then, last one, then I need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, you are absolutely right, uh, and this really explains how in our society property has become inescapable. Uh, so that the only way for us uh, to be slightly freed from 
property is to have a collective property, which I agree with you, uh, doesn't completely uh, undermine property. Uh, but for me, that is a one step, because in fact, uh, it undermines at least the liberal democratic uh, assumption that property is individual, somehow. Uh, the second thing is that, yes, of course, the property remain, um, and in fact, uh, um, you know, one of the most interesting case, you know, about the history of, of property is, uh, is actually the early Franciscans, uh, Francis of Assisi. You know that Francis of Assisi wanted to reject property. He really desperately tried to say, we want to leave apostolic poverty, which means we want to refuse any possession. There is a, a story when Francis goes to visit a, a community of, of monks, and he sees them building a church, not even their houses. They're building a church. And he, get, he goes nuts. He starts to actually take the, 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 the stones of the church and throw them away, uh, stopping them to build, because he realized they're building a possession. They're, they're, and he wanted actually to uh, move from the idea of possession to the idea of use. <laughs> like, I use this table, I use this clothing, uh, I use the, the place, but I don't own it. And actually, he, the church uh, forced the Franciscans to not go that way, to not actually, uh, uh, let's say, uh, assume this very radical principle. So after Francis' death, the Franciscans became the biggest owners <laughs> of land uh, in many uh, Italian and European cities. Uh, so, in a way, even, you know, such a crazy, radical person couldn't uh, uh, break uh, the principle of, of property. So, you, you're absolutely right. I think we have to, that's why for me the idea of property is very important to always keep in mind. Exactly, as you said, to not romanticize cooperativism and co-housing, because often these um, initiatives really collapsed when uh, uh, the, uh, the members of these uh, associations are confronted with this dilemma, you know, whether I try to use my house uh, or I try to, you know, in case you find your houses in a, in a very, where, you know, the land value has raised, you know, I can sell it and make a lot of money. I know actually a lot of cooperative communities that have been that have faced that dilemma. And uh, at that point, the choice, is, the decision is very political. So, whether the cooperative, if the cooperative is just just a, an economic, uh, uh, a form of economic opportunism, of course, people are very happy to to treat it as an asset. But if the people are really politically committed to that project. I know a lot of examples of people who have not given up uh, and have maintained this kind of idea because they're aware that the, the whole idea of, of, of a cooperative or a community land trust is to really withdraw uh, domestic space from, from the market. Yeah. Thank you very much.